May he be lifted up. Glory, glory, well, hallelujah. Friends don't treat me. Friends don't treat me. Like you. Since I laid my burdens down. Don't treat me. Like they used to. Since I laid my Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down, Lord. Since I laid my burdens down. Burdens down, Lord. Burdens down, Lord. Since I laid Every round goes high and high. Every round goes high and high. High and high. Since I laid down. Round goes high and high. High and higher. Since I laid down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Hallelujah. Since I laid my would you please stand for the reading of God's holy word and for our prayer? I'll be coming from Romans chapter 8, starting with verse 24, Romans 8 and 24. And it reads, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, what doth he hope for? But if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our firmness, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercessions for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. I read Romans chapter 8, verses 24 to 28. May the Lord have blessing to the healers, hearers, doers, and believers of his mighty word. You may be seated. May we go to the throne of grace. Our Father, who art in heaven, how be thy holy and righteous name. Heavenly Father, once again, we come to you. First of all, we have to say thank you. Thank you for watching over us last night. Thank you for waking us this morning. And then thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for letting us have a, the use of our limbs and have a little bit of uh, uh, of saying that that's what in our soul we have to say thank you dear heavenly father for just watching over us last night but dear heavenly father we have to say thank you for being with us all day long you've been with us as we went to and fro we've been you've been with us when we 
We didn't know that you was with us, but yet and still you blessed us, dear Heavenly Father. And we have to say thank you. And dear Heavenly Father, we come this night. Just dear Heavenly Father, just bless the teaching of this uh, of the the uh, revival, and then bless the preaching of this revival. Dear Heavenly Father, we need to be revived. Therefore, dear Heavenly Father, we just touch us, just touch us here, so therefore we can go out and touch others. And therefore, let them uh, see our light shine, but it's your light that's shining through us, dear Heavenly Father. We have to say thank you. And then, dear Heavenly Father, well, we just say we look to the hills for which cometh our help. Our help don't come from the hill, but it come from beyond the hill. It come from you, dear Heavenly Father. It's going to be you that watches over us as, as, as we go this day and each and every day. But dear Heavenly Father, just bless all the churches that might be open in, in your name. So therefore, uh, 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 Wednesday prayer service, uh, Wednesday Bible teaching, whatever it may be, dear Heavenly Father, they have to be looking towards you. But dear Heavenly Father, just bless them. And then, dear Heavenly Father, let go by the nursing home, dear Heavenly Father. Touch the ones that's, that, that's not be able to get out and, and, and bless the ones that's in the hospitals, dear Heavenly Father. Some of them may be down, or some of them might be on the on their own bed of affliction, dear Heavenly Father. But just you know what's wrong with them. You're going to touch them. You're going to touch each and every one. You're going to give them the spirit to let them know that you are sitting in heaven, waiting on them, dear Heavenly Father, as long as they wait on you. But yet still, they have to say thank you, dear Heavenly Father. They have to say thank you. They just can't say thank you and, and, and don't mean it. But it has to be meant, dear Heavenly Father. It's got to be from the heart. And therefore, you know the heart, dear Heavenly Father. And then, dear Heavenly Father, we go into this service. Just bless the ones that's here, dear Heavenly Father. Bless the ones that's on their way, dear Heavenly Father. Just be with us, guide us, and keep us. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of us said together, amen.
so here I am. And here is the lesson I will present. I want to present about, to talk about a revival. What is a revival? Why do we have a revival? I was researching all of this today and in the last, in the last several days. Of that. And it occurred to me that we need a revival for one thing because Jesus said in the parable of the soul that only 25% of the world will be saved throughout eternity. Because he said that there were, there were places when he described the ones about the people that received the word by the wayside, stony places, seeds among thorns, and seeds deceived by on good ground. And when you look at those four, only one of them, of the four, 25% received the word of God. So that kind of says that uh, somewhere along the line, we need a revival. And who gives a revival? It's not man. The only revival that can happen in our lives is through God and through the Holy Spirit. When we look at that and we say that God is our Redeemer, that Jesus is our Redeemer, but revival with respect to Christians is the following. It describes a movement of God's Spirit. Holy Spirit brings renewal and transformation of the following. He transforms individuals if they are willing, communities, and in nations. Now, individuals, we are probably more familiar with that particular one because we, uh, I grew up with, basically, I accepted Christ. The Lord revival of church. I sat on the front pew, mourner's bench, and I listened to sermons for all week, about five days a week. And it was the sermons were there to convince me that I needed a Savior. Without a Savior, I will be among that 75% that have not received Christ. Now, communities also need Christ. When you look at our nation, basically, when you look at the world wars that we had, World War II specifically, the nation became under basically one rule. They were ruled by basically one goal that they had in mind, to win the war. But it, God was in the midst of those things. I don't think he was in the midst of the ones that have occurred since then. Now, nations also, when Israel was established in 1948, that was through the Holy Spirit. Basically, they renewed, gave them the land back, some of the land back. But it's not that final land that they will receive during eternity. Christians must realize that revival is a sovereign work of God. Now, who needs revival? Many Christian homes need revival. Our churches need a revival. Our nation needs a revival. The entire world needs a revival. Now, individuals need a revival to return to the place they first believed. But here is all important truth about those listed in need of a revival. No economic upturn will bring about that revival. No military power can bring about that a revival. And no election of officials can bring about that power. It is only through the Holy Spirit that we do it today. A revival is a sovereign work of God Almighty. Now, an outpouring of God's life-giving spirit on his people is what a revival is all about. When you sit in the, I was sitting on the morning's bench, and I listened to the things the minister said. I, I didn't take it all in, but because my mother made me be there. So. It was there, but I, 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 I can't say that I never had said to believe it, because I always believed it, but I was kind of at the age of about 10 or 11 or something like that. I, you, you have mixed emotions and thinks, and you, you think about it in certain ways. And uh, fortunately, I think I had a, a grandfather who was a minister, and he was basically instilling in me some of those things. But 
The Holy Spirit is a power that created that awareness in me during those days. And that was something that was missing in my life. You, 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 when you I listen to people talk about it, and then I'd say, well, what's it all about? They tell me about the, there's a spirit and you get this and you, the Holy Ghost catches you. But I didn't know what that meant. I was there and I would watch them and I say, well, is it real or is it just a show? But you know that if you really have the Holy Ghost, you will know it. And people around you will know it. You have, there's no denial of it. Because when the Holy Spirit gets over, overcomes you, basically, you don't have any control of it anymore. It's just you doing what the Holy Spirit says you, can, you should do. So it is a responsibility of the believer to respond, uh, basically, to the Holy Spirit and this Holy Spirit call. Once you accept Jesus, then the revival just started. Because you can imagine that after you have accepted Christ, who's going to come in and try to turn you away from Christ? That will be Satan himself. And so you need to be revived on a daily basis in those cases. And many people basically kind of say, okay, I've accepted Christ and that's all I need to do. But that's not all we need to do. That's the acceptance of Christ, but then we've got to invite the Holy Spirit into our hearts. Once we accept him, he's there. But if we don't use him, then he's just going to sit there and wait on us. They'll wait for us until we decide what we're going to do. So Psalms, the 51st chapter, verses 10 through 12, says what a person must do. He says, if you want the Holy Spirit to be with you, so create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and, great, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. So these are the things that what uh, basically the Psalms were saying. And then Isaiah, the 55th, 55th chapter, verse 6, tells similar things. It tells who needs a revival to, to do the following. If you're going to seek the Lord while he is found, can be, may be found, call on him while he is near. If you allow yourself to just say, well, I'll do it tomorrow. If you've been pricked by something that you know that you shouldn't be doing and you feel that you're going back into your old ways, the Holy Spirit is there near you. All you have to do is call him. But if you deny and don't call on him, what's going to happen over a period of time? Satan will take control of the things you will be basically needing in need of a great need of a revival. Call on him daily. Do not wait until you are in the midst of the upheaval to call on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will still be there for you, but if you wait until you're in deep trouble, then you've got more troubles. It's hard, it's easier when you basically start off at the beginning and realize that you need a Savior, and the Holy Spirit is that one that Jesus sends to us. He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. And he said that the Holy Spirit was that comforter. So the Holy Spirit responds to what Jesus says. When we pray to, to God or Jesus, when we want to do things, things to do, basically when God answers us, he can answer us through the Holy Spirit because he's the one. He said, these are the things that I'm going to do for you. He told his disciples, says, some things you're going to forget that I told you, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to remind you of those things, especially when you get in trouble and when you're being persecuted. You will be happy. You have the Holy Spirit to call on. And then when we go to the Job, the 28th, second chapter, verse 28, instructions the Israelites, if they revive their allegiance to God, what will happen to them? And it says, it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see the visions. So it's things that you can expect when you accept the Holy Spirit. Ask the Lord uh, to pour out his spirit on you just as he promised to do for Israel. He will also do the same for us today. Now, what about the spirits that we talked about? 
Is there a revival in the Bible that we can talk about and look at? There are several of them in there, but I want to just concentrate on two. One in the Old Testament and one in the New Testament. Hezekiah desired for a revival for the people of Israel. A most important revival occurred in the Old Testament when Hezekiah realized that Israel needed a revival, so he did the following. He basically cleansed the temple of all the defilement. And there was quite a bit that was in there. So he uh, basically restored that. Restored the priests and Levites to their proper duties. And basically they had kind of just pushed the, the Levites and, and the priests out. They were doing things that shouldn't be done in the temple. It was never intended to be done in the temple. So Hezekiah did this because he saw that Israel needed a spiritual cleansing of their hearts and minds to turn away from sin. Hezekiah saw that Israel basically, need, basically needed to recommit or revise their services to God. He basically started doing that. To revive Israel, he prayed to God mercy and forgiveness for the sins of the people. God answers his prayers by healing the nation. It's, this revival was from God to honor Hezekiah's request for a revival for Israel to return to God. Hezekiah prayed that it would be a revival, that people would return to God because they've been serving idol gods. They might go to the temple, but uh, after the temple service, they'd head down to the idols, the groves, do the things that they, know they wanted to do, and it didn't involve God. So, then we had the revival, and when we look at it in the New Testament, and this is what it's basically we are most, most associated with, and that's a revival at Pentecost. The day of Pentecost marks the most important revival for Christians today. The Holy Spirit was the source of this revival. The Holy Spirit is always the source of revival, but this was specifically after Christ has left, he told them to stay there in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And when the Holy Spirit came, it was like a rushing mighty wind that came in and did things for them that they'd never seen. The Holy Spirit was the source of this revival. The Holy Spirit poured out on the disciples and they began to preach the gospel to the people. The gospel was basically the good news that Jesus had been teaching them all this time. Now here are the most important facts about the revival of, on the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit was the source of the revival. He empowered them and led God's people to pro proclaim the truth and demonstrate his power. So as you can see, this revival was not a human effort. It was basically started by the Holy Spirit coming down and basically empowering all of the people. Some that basically started speaking in different tongues. They, didn't, they probably wanted what it was saying, there were many people in Jerusalem and they basically had spoken different languages, but they all understood it because the Holy Spirit gave them utterances to understand the language and speak it also during this time. So no man could have done that. It was the work of the Holy Spirit that did that. Now, when we look at the Holy Spirit, the revival, we got to look at something else here. And that is, as we progress in our lives, we know that there's a day that we're born, and we know that there's a day that we're going to leave here. Now, if Christ comes back before uh, we depart this world, then we will be here again. He will come back and call our name. But here's the most important fact about the revival of, on the day of Pentecost. Now, listen to that, but the end results of being of a revival. Some today, someday, all of God's children today will experience a new heaven and a new earth. This reward is expressed and described in Revelations, the 21st chapter, verses 1 through 8. And if you're basically listening, I will go through that. And it says, starting at verse 2, it says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, 
prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. But we are that bride of Christ. Christ is uh, basically the bride, the bridegroom, and we are the, the bride of Christ. And I heard, verse 3 says, and I heard a voice, a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. So during the time when Christ comes, he's going to take us back. Now, we know that there's two things, three things, the places in this world we that that's going to change. He says that basically there's going to be a new heaven, and there's going to be a new Jerusalem, and men will dwell on earth and be ser in service to God in Jerusalem, which will be, you can consider that the capital of the, of the earth in this time. Now, verses 4 says, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. Now, this can refer to basically during the tribulation, there were a lot of tears that were shed during that time. Many Christian, many people that decided to accept Jesus basically couldn't, they couldn't get a job, they couldn't eat food. The Antichrist was basically saying, if you don't serve me, you're not going to eat, you're not going to do anything. And if anybody helps you, they're going to suffer the same thing you do. So it's going to be a time a time that God is going to allow Satan to do his thing. But fortunately, he's only for a short time, seven-year period. And verse 4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. But the old order of things has passed away. All the things we go through today during this life won't exist in eternity. People that suffer during the living if you gave somebody a water, Basically, you could be, there could be a death sentence for you. So many people went thirsty. So God is saying, those tears that you shared because you're wondering why all these things happened to me, then you know. I'm taking that tears away from you. You don't have to thirst anymore because I will provide everything that you need. Verse 5 says, he who is seated, was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write it down. But these words are trustworthy and true. It said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. So Alpha and Omega. Look at that. God created this world. He was there, Jesus. Holy Spirit and the Holy God the Father were there. And they created this world. And Jesus is saying, I am the Alpha and Omega. I was there for all of these events. And I'm going to say, there then and at the end, Omega, be there basically in the world. Because I will be through this world. The sacrifice that Jesus made basically created a revival for us. Because he died for us. And we can be revived through Jesus because the world was looking for a leader. Israel was looking for a leader, but they were looking for the wrong leader. The important king, and Jesus came here to save their souls, died to save their souls. Now, in verse 7, it says, Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. If you want to inherit all of these things that Jesus is talking about, all you have to do is accept Jesus first of all and realize that you're going to have to be revived during this time. If you've accepted Christ at an early age, you're going to go through some things afterwards. And the world is going to try to change your mind and go take you to a different direction. Because it's just like that proverbial road. You're traveling down this road and you get to a fork in the road, you have a choice. Do you go straight, down the straight and narrow, or do you turn and look at that broad road over there that leads to the many lights? And sometimes we see the lights and we say, we're having fun over there. They are having fun, but it's not a godly fun. And so we sometimes travel and take that wayside, but 
the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit and dwell in you, ask him, he will basically lead you back. So this isn't going to occur throughout our lives. You're not going to say, I, I accept Jesus and everything's going to be perfect after that. Because Satan won't be there. Be subject to all kinds of things for that. So we will need a revival. If I accept Christ, when I accepted Christ, I accepted him, but I didn't know all there was to know about. I needed to be revived so that I could understand who he was. And if I didn't, wasn't revived, I was going down the wrong road. And so Christians today, churches today, need a revival need to be revived and understand who God really is, what he's done for us. We get involved in this world and we look at all the material things that are involved and we say, oh, that's really good. You really need to live in a good time. But that's all designed to get you away from God. And follow that. There's nothing wrong with having those things, but you have to realize that God is the source of all the things that you need. You don't you can't you can't straddle a fence. You gotta go one side or the other. So when you do that. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur, which is the second death. All of God's people will live either in heaven, the new Jerusalem, or on earth during eternity. Other groups, they won't live on either one of those places because they will be consigned to that lake of fire. You can say that it's on earth. It's not going to be on earth because God is going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And he's not going to allow those that basically have to file his, 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 his word during their lifetime. So he's saying, you're not going to have a place on earth, but you'll have a place for that place where I just basically set aside for those Satan and his uh, dominions and all of that. And if you don't accept me, where else can I send him? Send him to those places. It won't be in those, those three places. You got heaven. The new Jerusalem that comes out of heaven and then those that are still on earth because that is the place that God promised Abraham and his people, his descendants, and they will be on earth. And there will be a countless number of Gentiles that will be there as well that come out of great tribulation. They will be on earth as well. And so when we look at these things, we know that God has a plan. I said, when we look at the parable of the sower, we realize that only 25% of the people in this world, from the, turn, from the beginning until the eternity, will be accepting Christ, because that's what Jesus said. Now, if you notice, it is said about, uh, basically, if you notice what is said about the souls of those who refuse to believe it, accept Jesus, you know that's where they're going. Not in, they won't be a part of God's kingdom during this time. They will not reside either on earth, certainly not in heaven, or the new Jerusalem, they will have a special habitation that God has said designed for Satan and his angels. And if you have forgotten and left the love of Jesus Christ and your Savior and not allowed the Holy Spirit to revive you to the ways of Jesus, you will suffer the consequences of those that are not there. So when we look at things, and I conclude my lesson, it's a short one, I wanted to get the point across. We need a revival at all times. A revival is not something we do, we do it once a year, but we all need a revival all the time. We need a revival in the church on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. How many people go to church on Sunday, and listen to the sermon, and go home and forget about what was said, and go to Sunday school, they forget about what was read there because they get involved in the world and large. All of the things that's available to them. Years ago, all of these things weren't available. The technology that we have now, but now you can enjoy things. It used to be, as far as you could go, is how much food you could feed the mule and the horse. But now, you can get in the car, 
You can drive and drive as long as you've got some gas in the car or an electric gas if you want to use that. God has allowed mankind to progress in such a way, but we need a revival. When we look at these things and we say, look at all of this good stuff that I have. I'm going to go out and get me a career and I'm going to basically get that career and I'm going to basically enjoy all of these things on earth. And you can do that. Enjoy things on earth. But what about the happening? What about when you die? Nobody considers that because they feel that I'm a good person. God is love. And if that's the case, I'm going to make my case to God if I meet what I need. It's like, Lord, I'll take my chance in this. But if you have not accepted Christ, it does not matter what you have done. You will be cast into the lake of fire. A revival is what we as Christians need, and a revival is what we as Christians need to teach to others. When people join our church, especially the youth, if they join the church, we need to be there for them to let them know that they need to be revived on a continual basis, because if they don't, the world will, will basically constantly knock on their door, and after they're not so long, sooner or later, something will occur, and you will accept it, and open the door, and invite the world into your life, and then reject Jesus. But something has to be said that if you didn't really accept Jesus in the beginning, you can't be lost if you say But if you basically didn't just did it just because your friends did to join the church, join the church, don't say you. Well, the church will accept Christ and invite the Holy Spirit into then you are saved. But you still have to be a revival. The church needs a revival because Many people come in, they're critical of everything that goes on, critical of the pastor, critical of the deacons, critical of every organization. In here. But that was not an attempt of God when he did this, when he established the church. We need a revival so that we can realize that all of these things are in place. And it's not for us to decide what should happen in the church. The church belongs to Jesus. He established the kingdom of God. Basically, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If we can do these things and accept it. We'll never be perfect in this world. Because there are three things that prevent us from being perfect. That is pride, covetousness, and we have a spirit, a carnal spirit that says, I'm going to do that. I don't care what God says. And you may say that and laugh at that, but that happens. Think about sometimes when you basically want to do something when you know what the Spirit says, and then you get in it and you, you feel so good doing it, you say, well, the Lord will forgive me. We do these things. We've got to keep conscious, be conscious of all the things that we do and make sure that when we go through these things, a revival is there. Revival basically is the work of the Holy Spirit. A revival with respect to Christians is the following, as I said. It describes a movement of God's Spirit. The Holy Spirit brings a revival, a transformation to the following people. Individuals, communities, and nations. That is all that I have to say on this lesson. Thank you for listening.
Would you please turn to 18 in the A and 348 in the B? Revive us again. We praise thee. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of our love, for Jesus who died and is now gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Be. Verse 4. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Be by one more time, hallelujah. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. Sometimes I have to cry sometimes. Trouble. Trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes. I have to cry sometimes. I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night. But that's all right. That's all right. I know that Jesus, Jesus he will, will fix it after a while. After a while. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to moan sometimes. I have to moan sometimes. Trouble. Trouble in my way. I have to moan sometimes. I have to moan sometimes. I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night. Oh, but that's all right. That's all right. I know that Jesus, Jesus, he will fix it after a while. After a while, step in the furnace. Step in the furnace. A long time ago. Long time ago. Step back and be sad. And a bad nigga. And a bad nigga. I say they wasn't worried. They weren't worried. Oh, this I know. This I know. Cause I know Jesus. Jesus, he will fix it. After a while. After a while. Who stepped in the furnace? I said a long time ago. Long time ago. Sad rack and me sad. And the bed me go. And the bed me go. I tell you they wasn't worried. They weren't worried. Oh, this I know. This I know. Cause I know Jesus. Jesus, he will fix. Yes, I know Jesus. Jesus, he will fix. Don't you know Jesus? Jesus, he will yes, fix. Yes, I know he will. Jesus, he will Oh, fix he's it. a doctor in the sick room. Jesus, he will fix. He's it. my lawyer in the courtroom. Jesus, Yes, I know he will. Yes, I know he will. Hey, no mountain too high. Oh, no valley too low. No river too wide. My God loves me so. Yes, I know he will. Oh, I know he will. Has he done it for you? Jesus, he will fix it. Has he done it for you? Jesus, he will fix it. Why don't you clap your hands? Jesus, he 
Come on and clap your hands. Jesus, he will. Cause you know he will. Jesus, he will. Yes, you know he will. Jesus, he will. Oh, I know Jesus. Jesus, he will fix it. After a while. After a while. Trouble in my way. Trouble in my way. I have to moan sometimes. I have to moan sometimes. Oh. Trouble. trouble in my way. I have to moan sometimes. I have to moan sometimes. I lay awake at night. I lay awake at night. Oh, but that's all right. That's all right. Cause I know Jesus. Jesus, He will fix it after a while. After a while. Yes, He will. Amen. Would you please stand and join us in our hymn, 106 in the A and 120. One oh six in the A. God sent his son. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. 
They called him Jesus. He came to love. He came to love. Heal and forgive. Heal and forgive. He lived and died. He lived and died. To buy my pardon. To buy my pardon. An empty grave. An empty grave is there to prove. My Savior Verse 2, how sweet to hold. How sweet to hold. A, a newborn baby. A newborn baby. And feel the pride. And feel the pride. And joy he gives. And joy he gives. But greater still. But greater still. The calm assurance. This child can face. This child can face uncertain days because he lives. Because he lives. Because he lives. I can face tomorrow. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Because he lives. All fear is gone. Fear is gone because I know. Because I know he holds a future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Verse three, and then one day, and then one day I'll cross the river. I'll fight life's final final war with pain and then as death gives way to victory I'll see the lights I'll see the lights of glory and I know Please take your seat. Because he lives, I can face. I can face tomorrow. Because he lives. Because he lives. All fear is gone. All fear is gone. Because I know. Because I know. He holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. God's children said amen. It's another day's journey and we're glad about it. We're glad to be in the Lord's house one more time. Amen. Pastor Molan, amen, Minister Gaston, and to all of my fellow co-laborers in the gospel ministry, amen. We bless the Lord for your presence, amen. God is good, and he's grateful to be praised. Thank you, five wonderful selections. Thank you again, greater peace for the privilege of being in part of this revival. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come in the name of Jesus, thanking you again for the privilege to be able to stand in John's shoes and preach the word of the Lord. We pray, God, that you will give us clarity of thought and speech as we expound upon your word. We ask, Lord, that your word would fall on good ground tonight and convict our hearts, that we might embrace the charge to teach. But more so, we pray for those in which we do teach, that their hearts might believe in the importance of it and then receive it. We ask now that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer, and every saved soul said amen, amen and praise God. Amen. It's another day's journey, and we're glad about it. And certainly we're glad to be in the Lord's house one more time. God is our keeper. 
Amen. We are leaning and depending upon him for everything. You know, it's just a blessing to see another day. Amen. Amen. Because we know that there are some that did not have this same privilege. But nevertheless, the Lord has spared our lives for a reason. Amen. Amen. That is to give glory and praise to his name. Amen. We began this preaching series on last night uh, with the theme, Teach Them. We saw last night where God gave a charge to Abraham that he was to teach his family and his household the will and the way of the Lord. But tonight we want to call your attention to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 4 through verse number 9. Of Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through verse number 9. It reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Amen. Tonight's message is entitled, Moses Teach Them. Amen. Moses teach them. Now what I read to you in this sixth chapter is known called the Shema. And what it means is that it is the confession of faith that Jews make about their conviction about God. It had been taught to them since the days of Moses. And even today, observant Jews still practice this principle of the Shema. Verse number four, where it says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Shema came during the time when Moses was giving his last sermons, or to say another way, his last messages. Moses was soon to pass on and he knew the kind of people that he had been leading for 40 years. He understood that these people were not like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Most of these people didn't have the prayer life that Daniel had. They didn't have that kind of conviction of faith as Elijah. Moses understood the group that he worked with. They didn't see God kind of visions like Ezekiel. They were not that kind of people. Instead, these people were stiff-necked people. These people were a stubborn people. They were a fickle people. The majority of them really didn't know sometimes where they would stay. Oftentimes, Moses would ask the, ask the question, who's on the Lord's side? They had to kind of make up their mind. Were they going to serve the golden calf or were they going to serve the true God of Israel? So this was the kind of people that Moses was working with. You could say that he had a difficult crowd to work with. And so he understood as a leader that as he moved off the scene, if the next generation was to survive, they needed to hear what God was saying to them through these commandments. They needed teaching. Yes, preaching is good, but in this text, God says to Moses, teach those people. 
They must have some fundamental principles to stand on. You're soon to leave and Joshua is to take over and then a younger generation will come in behind him. And if those people are gonna have a chance to survive in Canaan land with all of these idols and so forth, those people are going to have to be properly taught. And we say the same thing about us and our generation that is soon to come. Can we say the same thing that they too and we too are gonna to have to have some good fundamental teaching that without the teaching as move on into the rest of this 24th century or 21st century, no telling where these people will end up. That's why we have the theme of this revival, the importance of teaching. Moses was out there in an area known as the plain of Moab. God showed Moses, first of all, what to teach, and then secondly, how to teach. We can take the example of this man of God and apply these same principles in our lives, in our teaching, in our churches. We need to know, first of all, what to teach. And we find here some guidelines on how to teach. Well, the text shows us tonight that what we ought to teach and what we must teach, verse four says, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. One of the things that we must teach our children and grandchildren, generations to come, that we serve a, a monotheistic God. Our God is not polytheistic. Our God does not share in a pantheon with other gods. But our God is a singular God. He is expressed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit but he is still one God. And so when we serve, we are serving one God. A God that does not share his authority. A God that does not share his sovereignty. He is one God. And so it is important for us to come to know who he is. We must teach this to generations to come. Even the name of the Lord in this text is Adonai. And what Adonai means is sovereign Lord. We must teach that our God is a sovereign God. The whole world ought to bow down to him. Because the Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that he is Lord. Yes, he's not one of the Lords. He's not a choice of God. He's, he's not a God that you fashion yourself because it fits what you want to do. But we must teach that our God is one. He is expressed through his son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, to know our God, we must know Jesus Christ. We must teach our children and grandchildren there's no such thing as just being spiritual. Yes, there's only one spirit, and he is God the spirit, known as Holy Spirit. Sometimes our generation now say, real, I don't go to church. I don't read all the Bible that was written by man and so forth, but I am a spiritual person. But we must teach them that's wrong. We must teach them according to the Bible. The only way to know God's spirit, you must know Jesus Christ. Yes, Jesus Christ, spoken, expressed through his word. 
is the only way to truly know God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and following, says it like this. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, but has in these last days spoken to us by his son, who he has appointed heir of all things uh, through whom he made uh, the word. If you are to know this God uh, that we speak of, we must know Jesus Christ. We have to be taught who he is. We have to learn uh, what he spoke. And we must apply it to our lives. Yes, Moses teach them. Teach them that they are to love our God. He says here, you shall love the Lord your God. He did not say you shall like God. He did not say you should be fond of God. But he said teach the children to love God. Teach the children to have such a passion for God that he is placed first in everything. This is something that has been lost in the modern era. If they love God or if they have some affinity towards God, he is not first in everything. Therefore, we've got to teach the generation we must seek ye first the kingdom of God. His righteousness and all these things shall be added uh, unto you. How should we love God? Moses, we ought to love God uh, in at least three ways. We ought to love him uh, with all uh, our heart. Hebrew word for heart means the seat of who you are. In essence, the very seat of the very depth of your being, the very beat that keeps you alive, that's what you love God with. Yeah, you don't just superficially love God. We've got to teach our children that we reverence God in such a way that in every beat that comes through our being, it is focused on God. You got to give God uh, your whole heart. And just give God part of your life and have another part somewhere else. But with everything uh, of who you are. Therefore, it leaves no room to say, I'll serve him today and I'll put him off on tomorrow. He's the seat of who you are. Now, love God with all your heart but also with all your soul. That word soul is the breath of who you are. Yes, just like we must have breath in order to live, we must have God in order to live. And the minute our breath is taken from us, we are rendered powerless. We must teach our children when God is not in your life, you are rendered powerless. You have no grip. You can't move. You can't think. You can't survive. You cannot exist. You can't breathe. Amen. Without God. He's like running a race and losing your win. You lose your win, you'll soon lose the race. We got a whole lot of folk today trying to run the race of life without the breath of God. But when you have a love for him with your soul, then you have what it takes to keep from burning out. See, so many people today burn out and quit, can't keep going because we fail to love God with our breath. Oh, in him we move. In him we have our being. Then he said, Moses, teach them to love me with all of 
of their strength, all of their physical, emotional, and mental makeup, all that allows their structure to function, teach them to love me with that. Teach them to take their bodies and not use their bodies for their own self clothing Teach them to take their muscles and not use their muscles to commit sin. Teach them to take their feet and not use their feet to run to wickedness. Teach them to take their strength that did not come of, of their own selves, but take their strength that comes from me in order that they might live. Therefore, Moses lays out before the children of Israel. Amen. What is to be taught to them? Then he lays out, it is important that there is a way of teaching. Says the way of teaching, the how of teaching, it must take place diligently. It is not enough to teach the children sometimes. But the word says, diligently teach your children. And in order to do that, it is important for us as teachers to be present. One group or one gender that is spoken of here is the man. That as Moses speaks to Israel in this text, he's really speaking to the men. And he said, men, you are the chief teachers of your children. And we have missed that point in the modern era because oftentimes our children are getting their spiritual training from their mother, from their grandmother, from some other woman. But the Bible here says, me, you ought to be the lead teachers in your household. In order to do that, it is important for you to be present. And when you are present, you don't just teach with words, but you also teach in action. Yes, my testimony is I seldom had my dad sit down and teach me, per se, a Bible lesson. One thing that my dad and parents did for me is that they taught me through presence. You see, growing up Second Baptist on my own, I would have never gone to church as a child. I would have stayed at home and watched the football game. But I thank God for my dad. I thank God for my parents that taught me through presence. They did not just send me to church, but they took me to church. And it is a mistake that parents and grandparents are making today, where at best they are sending the children to church. But if you're really to be effective in molding your children, as fathers, we must be present as well in order for them to see our lives. And as they see our lives, it gives more power to our words. Moses says to the elders, be present with your children. Live before them so they can see God in your life. And oh, if they are present, if you are present, it changes everything. He says, diligently work the lessons with your children. And if you diligently work them before long, they take it within uh, their own uh, lives. I have a dog now that's a German shepherd, and he's about five months of age. And the trainers say that what I need to do before my dog gets too old is I need to work with him and train him while uh, he's young. Trainer said, you don't work with him up now. In a few days, it'll be too late to get him where he needs to be. It is the same thing with our children. 
We must work with them while they are young to get them where they need to be. Therefore, Israel was to embrace that principle of working with the children while they were young. When I was in Israel not too long ago, a few months ago, I saw a class of young boys. They were about six or seven years of age. And the teachers brought those boys down to a place called the Wailing Wall. Yeah. While there at the Wailing Wall, they were teaching those young boys the importance of praying to one God. All right. We need to learn from that principle that we've got to take our young children while they are young in order that they might learn the one God. Don't wait till they become adults, but bend the sapling while it's young in order that we can mold them in the way they should go. But I learned over my years of ministry that we don't have much problem getting the children to come to church. The real problem is in the adults. If we can get the adults where they need to be, the children quite naturally will fall along. God was saying to Moses the same thing. He said, if I can get the men where they need to be, then their children will naturally follow along. He says, diligently work with them. He says, here is how to teach them. He says, first of all, talk to them when you sit in your house. Yes, we've got to do more than teach our children at the church building. But we've got to teach our children in uh, our homes. Every opportunity, use it to focus the emphasis on God. Yes, the baby is looking at the ball game. Use it as an opportunity to say, look how God gives uh, those players strength to run. The baby is playing uh, with their video games. Use it as an opportunity to say, look how God puts dexterity in uh, your pain. What I'm saying is every opportunity. Use it as a chance to talk about God. Yes, we can't just talk about ourselves, but we've got to talk about the Lord. Yes, for too long, these babies have disconnected themselves from God. Somehow they have a social life. And over here, they have a a spiritual life. But what we must do is make the two lives intersect into one. Help them to realize your social life will never be what God wants it to be until you've been taught the spiritual principles of God. He even says when you walk by the way there's another opportunity to teach them. I remember one time a little boy riding in the car with his dad to church. He would take them a long way out of town for a service. Every now and then, the little boy wake up and say, Daddy, have we made it to church yet? And the daddy would respond, no, son, we're not there yet. Over and over, he asked, Daddy, have we made it to church yet? No, we haven't made it yet. Finally, uh-huh. one time, he asked again, and he responded by saying, Daddy, it's so a long way to get to church. And the daddy said, he may not come when you want, but it's always right on time. What was daddy doing? Daddy was teaching by the way, by traveling up on the road. He used another opportunity to teach 
about the Lord. Yeah. You see, teaching is more than just sitting down in a classroom. Yeah. Teaching is turning your whole life into a classroom. Yeah. That every time you get a chance to interact, use it as an opportunity to teach. Francis and Sissy said it like this. He said, preach all the time. Well, Every now and then use uh, words. That same principle can apply for teaching. Yeah. Teach all the time. Yeah. Every now and then use uh, words. Because yeah. people are watching us all the time. Yeah. They want to see where we stand with God. How do you teach, he says, when you lie down? He's saying when it's time to go to bed, yeah. let those children go to bed with God on their minds. Yeah. You can't just let them get in the bed and go to sleep. We got to tell them, hold up, baby. You must first say your prayers yeah. at night. Yeah. We got to teach them how to say some prayers. Don't allow them to make their own decisions about their spirituality no, you're right. because they cannot make decisions uh, at that age. They need a teacher. Yeah. They need somebody as a mentor right. to guide them uh, in their spiritual lives. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, asking a child to make his own decision about his spirituality is just like asking a child do you want a vaccination shot? Yeah. Most children will quite naturally say no. That's why God says, baby, you need some parents. You need some grandparents that understand the value of the vaccinations. It is the same thing in the spiritual lives. Yeah. God gives children parents who understand the value of a spiritual vaccination. Yeah. Oh, is there anybody here tonight? You've been shot up by God. Yeah. Yes, you have the Lord's spirit all inside of you. Yeah. Yes, he puts clapping uh, in your hand. Yeah. He puts stomping uh, on your feet. Yeah. He puts a shout on your lips. Yeah. You've been shot up by God. you got to take that same spirit that moves inside of you. And you've got to share it with uh, your children. When they lay down, tell them uh, about God. When they rise up, tell them uh, about God. Don't let them sit down at the breakfast table. Without first giving thanks to God. Don't let them just run and get them biscuits and pancakes and bacon and whatever else is there. First tell them uh, who provided it. Tell them not just daddy made the biscuit, but tell them God made the biscuit. Tell them not just mama made the pancake, tell them God made the pancake. Keep on their mind that every good and perfect gift uh -huh. comes up from above. Yeah. Don't let them leave your house without you praying for them. Yes, pray for them in the morning. Uh -huh. Pray for them in the noonday. Yeah. Pray for them in the midnight hour. Don't allow them to bring somebody into your house. Uh -huh. That is not open to the God uh, that you serve. Yeah. Yes, one day the boy had his girlfriend. Yeah. Decided that they go over to Mama's house. When the boy brought his girl over, Mama began to ask some questions. Mama wanted to know, baby, who your people? Yeah. Baby, where you come from? Yeah. What school do you go to? How old are you? This, that, and the other. Then the question came, Mama said, what church do you attend? What are you saying? Mama was teaching. 
that if you're going to have a girlfriend, boyfriend, what have you, he or she needs to know the God that we serve. How many of you must know that our God is so big that he ain't going to share the house with no other God? How many of you know how Jesus is so great? That he's not going to share with another Jesus. you got to come on over with our God. Oh, you got to hit the road. Ruth said, my God will be your God. Your people will be my people. What were they saying? They said, we all going to serve the same God. How do we know that our God is a good God? He is worthy to be praised. Yeah. Our God put a roof over our head. Yeah. You got to teach the children that. When they get into your fine car, tell them our God bought this car. Yeah. When they see you wearing your fine clothes, tell them our God put these clothes yeah. on us. Yeah. When they see you with that nice watch, tell them our God put this watch on my wrist. Yeah. They need to know our God. He is a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He is a way maker. He is a company keeper. He is a doctor in the sick room. He is a lawyer in the courtroom. He is our provider. Therefore, we got to teach them who our God is. Then he even shows when we're teaching about our God. Yes, he shows us how to teach about God. Yes, he says we need to give a model lesson. Yes, he says the model lesson is find them as a sign on your hand. Yes, Say you take the words of the commandment and put a sign on your hand that when they see your hand, they know your hand operates in the hand of the man that made the sea. When they see your hand, they know your hand has been touched by the God that created the whole world. When they see your hand, they see your hand as a hand of praise. What are you saying? You become a whole teaching model before your children. That when they see you, they see God working through you. In other words, there's no such thing as being one way in the church house and another way at home. But when they see you at home, the same joy you had at church, you even have that at your home. And that way they don't get a double image. And it helps them to understand clearly who God is. You see, sometimes our children are confused because they see a Mr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde kind of person. It is a double image. The babies look one way and see us this way. And then look another way and see us that way. And they began to scratch our head and say, which way is it? But if you just show a consistent lifestyle, you just know that God will be seen in you all the time. They say the Dallas Cowboys are like that. You can't tell what they going to do. One Sunday, they blow them out. The next Sunday, they're getting blown out. And the fans just scratch our head. And we know better than to put money on them. Because no telling what they're going to do. The children are the same way. They know better than to put money on us. Because they can't tell what we're going to do. But it says, let a sign be in your hands. Let frontlets be between your eyes. And that frontlet was like a little box that the Jews would put between their eyes. And in that box were the commandments of God. 
The point of it is that their whole mind was to be sanctioned by God's commandment. Yeah. Now today, we don't have to put a box between our eyes, but we still ought to have our whole mind sanctioned on Jesus Christ. The word says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. That is a mind of the spirit of God. And then it says, even on the doorpost, it says, put there the letters of the commandment on the doorpost of your house and your gates so that when people come in and go out, they can't help but to see the word of the Lord. And so God gives Moses instruction of how to teach the people. He showed them what to say. But he also showed them how to say it. And it told them to go forth and prepare the people. Because the next generation was soon to come. And I'm glad that the God that we serve, he's still a teaching God. He's still getting the people ready in order that they might know the word. And the Bible says, as you teach the people, when they crossed over the Jordan River, remind them about who I am. He says, when you have cities that are built and all those cities you didn't build, he says, when you have houses that are filled and those houses you didn't build, he says, when you have wells you didn't dig and you have olives and vineyards you didn't plant, he says, when you've eaten and gotten full, <laughs> he says, beware, <laughs> don't forget God. And that's what we must teach our children. Whatever you do, don't forget God. <laughs> because God is real. And he's still on the throne. <laughs> and the word says <laughs> that when they crossed the Jordan, <laughs> they came to two mountains. <laughs> One was called Mount Ebal. <laughs> And the other was called Mount Gerizim. Ha! And it was a teaching lesson. Ha! And Joshua said, those who are to go up to Ebal, ha! there is a place of curses. Ha! And so he spoke to those on Ebal ha! and said, just like this mountain is barren, ha! if you fail to keep my commandments, ha! You'll be barren in your life. But then he said, there are some at Mount Gershom. It's a mountain that's flourishing. And that flourishing mountain is symbolic of blessings. And so he said, teach the people that when you serve God, it results in blessings. Ha. You'll be blessed in your going out. Ha. You'll be blessed in your coming in. Ha. You'll be blessed in your body. Ha. You'll be blessed in your life. Ha. You'll be blessed in your head. Ha. You'll be blessed in your feet. Ha. He says all you have to do ha, is just keep being faithful ha, and live the word of God. Ha, and if you live God's word, ha, it will bless your life. Ha, and so I want to say tonight, ha, is there anybody here ha, that'll teach like Moses? Ha, is there anybody here ha, that'll teach like Abraham? Ha, is there anybody here huh, that'll teach like Jesus? Huh? Because through teaching, it opens the door for blessings to come 
in our lives. Moses, teach them. Show them what to teach. And then show them how to teach. That it results in blessings in the lives of God's people. Lord, we thank you for the word tonight. And we thank you for the power to preach the word. Help us, Lord Jesus, that we might be a teaching people. Then, Lord, we pray for receptive hearts who will say yes to your will and yes to your way. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The door of the church is open tonight. And there's somebody here today that says, Preacher, I need that teaching. I need that same word that was given to Abraham and Moses. I need it in my life that I might share it with my children, grandchildren, and others, that they be blessed. If you're here, the door is open. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, come tonight. We will share with you the plan of salvation, teach you how to know that you're saved. If you're here tonight and need a church home, come tonight and join church. Get involved in the teaching ministry because that's what gives you the foundation to know what you believe and then live it out. The door stands open. Shall we stand? Hallelujah. For yes, God is real. And he stands at the door of our hearts and knocks. And if only we'd come in and open up that door, he'll take root in our hearts. If you're here tonight, the invitation goes out to you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Yes, Lord. Somebody, as a result of this revival, say, I'm going to be a better teacher, be a better model. My children see God in my life. Amen.
Do you really know that he's real? Do you really know that he's real? Do you really, really know that he's real? Yeah, God is real. We thank God for this preacher tonight, the pastor, this evangelist, this teacher, who at one of our ministries used to say, he blew the horn again tonight. I like that. He blew it loud, didn't he? Our evangelist does not mind praying with us for us, giving him a moment to catch his breath. But I ask that you keep in mind the three family, there are three home goings going on Saturday, people that we know. Keep the Brown family in prayer. John family, Sister Mary Jones family, and Brother, Brother Dre Brown family. All going to happen on Saturday morning, the homeborn celebration. Just keep them in our prayer. And let's keep on thanking God for this preacher, this pastor, this evangelist, this teacher, this man of God, as we come now. He'll, he, be willing to pray with them. Pray for those who trust that the offering is welcome. Hola. Hola. God bless you. Thank you. Yes, Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. Mm. Voila. Mm -hmm. Voila. The Bible says that men ought always to pray, not faint. There's power in prayer. Hallelujah. So we're coming together on one accord. We read the word how when church came together God moved answered our prayers lift up the Jones family I believe Jones family and Brown family is that right got a third all right we're going to lift up these families that are breathing the song does ask the question, is you all on the altar? And we lay our all before God. He's able to take care. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you that you have a teachable people. As many times we are fervently teaching, but sometimes our hearts are not very teachable. But I thank you, Lord, that you have a teachable people. You still got some people who have not bowed down to idol gods. So, Lord, here we are at this altar right now. First of all, just declaring you are Lord. Help us to follow you and be obedient to your word. Give us the kind of heart to just trust you by faith and not make modifications and changes the way we want, but your will be done. Lord, we lift up these families that are bereaved. Pray, God, that you will comfort them because you are the God of comfort. You're able to wipe away every tear from our eyes. Pray for those families that are going through times of trial. You know the petitions on the hearts of those that Stand here right now. I lift up each one in the name of Jesus. God, as you answer prayer, as you make ways, as you show your sovereign will, we want to be careful to give you the praise. We're not trying to manipulate you, Lord. We just want to bow before you and surrender to you. Saying whatever your will is, help us to say yes to that. 
because we know that all things work together for the good. To them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to your purpose. Lord God, we ask that you would strengthen our hands and our minds and bodies to do your will, do your work. Help us to never grow weary in teaching because we know that we'll reap if we faint not. Help us to be faithful unto death. Encourage the hearts of everybody that hears my voice tonight. I pray that we'll all leave out with a made-up mind to do your will. Now, God, we say thank you. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We ask that you would have mercy where mercy be found. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And God bless you and keep you is our prayer. We love you in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Bless you. I remember the time that I didn't have to use those words so much. Okay. 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 So, so just, I thank you all for coming on the second night. Just back to the night. It's just like the little lady here about hump night. I guess the night was hump night. You hump it off. Got two more nights. Thursday night. Friday night. We pray to God that the revival will go on and go on to, to God to get ready to stop the revival. I don't foresee any time soon that God is going to stop it. God wants us to be revived. That's what the preacher tell us tonight. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, let me let me just ask the blessing of the two that took the prayer for the nourishment of our bodies. Father, we thank you for the food that you provided and the people that you used to prepare the food. And we ask, Lord, that you would let the food be nourished to our bodies, that we may continue to praise you.